Right, so let's now look at the question. Reading through, Chromex manufactures bicycles for the UK and European markets and has made a bid of 150 million to take over Bexel, their main UK competitor. We're told that because that has a bearing on part C. Do you remember the idea of UK government and how it may intervene? Well, it's something to do with monopoly, which is also active in the German market. Chromex currently supplies 24% of the UK market and Bexel has 10%. Add those together, you get over one third, and that would suggest that they had some degree of market domination. But what we're trying to do here, that's not important. Chromex anticipates labour savings of £700,000 per year. Right. Well, hold on a moment. If our costs fall, doesn't that mean that the net cash inflow will effectively rise? Created by more efficient production and distribution facilities, if the takeover is complete, completed. In addition, the company intends to sell off surplus land and buildings with a balance sheet value of 15 million. Well, if you remember, back in the requirement, we were told, somewhere down here, that if they were sold, they would be sold for 5 million less than the balance sheet valuation. Now, what I want to pick up on here is this. That selling of land and buildings is directly linked to the investment. So we can get some sort of net investment figure. Reading on. Total U UK bicycle sales were 400 million, fine to do with the monopoly issue. For the year ended the 31st of December, Bexel reported an operating profit of 10 million pounds. Ah, we have an issue here. We're given a profit but what we need for payback is a cash flow figure. Let's read on. Compared with a figure of 55 for Chromex. In calculating profits, Bexel included a depreciation charge of half a million. Note the takeover is regarded by Chromex in the same way as any other investment and is appraised accordingly. Well, okay, the first thing I want to get at is a very simple point, but it underpins quite a lot of the questions that we look at. If we were just to talk about this in general terms, first of all, we know that we want a cash flow because that is what is needed for payback. Unfortunately, what we're given here is a profit. Now, what's the difference between cash flow and profit? Well, the issue is, if you asked an F7 tutor, he or she would tell you that the difference was a whole host of different adjustments. But remember, we must keep it simple here. And the only difference that we have is depreciation, the obvious non-cash flow. Cash flow less depreciation gives us profit. Or in this example, if we have the profit, we can add back depreciation to get the cash flow figure. So, thinking this one through, it shouldn't be too difficult. If we were looking at the investment, we know that we have some sort of capital expenditure. Get used to it, I call it capex again and again. Capital expenditure buying the company. The capital expenditure was 150 million. Remember, as a direct result of the investment, we will dispose of land and buildings. Now, we were told that the book value was 15 million. But we're also told in the requirement that they are sold for five million less than that. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. We will get 10 million back. Therefore, our overall investment is 140 million. So, we have our investment. 
then we can look at our cash inflow. And I think the key feature in this question is that it will be the same cash inflow each year. If you try to do that periodic and cumulative working, you would go on forever here. If we remember that it's all the same, therefore we can do a simple calculation, life becomes that much easier. That being the case, cash inflow per annum. We have our profit. We said our profit was 10 million. To get from profit to cash flow, what do we do? Well, of course, we add back depreciation. Depreciation was 0.5 million. And remember, as a result of this investment, we expect to save money on labor. They are savings that will reduce the cash outflow and therefore increase the net cash inflow. So we end up with 11.2 million. Okay, we've got those two values. Is it going to be difficult to calculate payback? Well, my answer is no. Remember, if we have equal cash flows each year, which is very common in these questions, 140 divided through by 11.2. We get an answer of 12.5 years. Remember, we can only say whether that is good or bad if we are given something to compare it against. But let's just think about it this way. Effectively, we are buying a company. And because we're buying a company, maybe it's not surprising that the payback period is so long. The company is a going concern. And from that perspective, maybe we expect to earn profits way into the future. But again, don't second guess the examiner. If he told you payback had to be 10 years, we would reject. If he told you payback had to be within 15 years, we would accept. I don't think payback is a difficulty. Remember, three to five marks in the exam, not a big issue. But we want these marks. Now let's move on and look at our next method. The next method is something called return on capital employed, R-O-C-E. Although I must say I prefer calling it A-R-R, accounting rate of return. The reason is that you know what a return on capital employed is. You have already calculated R-O-C-E, maybe in your F7 paper. And as such, maybe there's a little bit of confusion. Before we talk about that, all I want to highlight is what it is that we're calculating. The return on capital employed simply shows you this. The impact of the investment. on accounting profit. Nothing more, nothing less. So if you have to discuss ROCE, that is a very useful starting point. We'll come back in a moment and discuss why we need to understand this impact. But before we do that, let's just go back that step and say, well, hold on a moment. You know ROCE as a performance measure. You know the sort of thing that you have calculated before, maybe in F5 or F7. And what we're looking at it is in terms of investment appraisal. So although they are called the same thing, they are two very different beasts. You see, when we're looking at a performance measure, what sort of time period do we look at performance over? Well, yes, it's normal to calculate ROCE over one year. We calculate profit and hence some measure of return over that year. But when we're looking at it from an investment appraisal perspective, 
we're not looking at one year. Instead, we're looking at the whole life of the project. And when are we looking at it? Well, if we're focusing on a performance measure, what we would say is simply this. The performance relates to the past. We're considering how well we did last year. If you think of any financial accounting, we are focusing on preparing statutory reports based on the previous financial period. But of course, when we look at investment appraisal, we're not looking at the past, we're looking at the future. And what's its use? Well, I suppose if we're looking at the performance measure, what we're trying to do is appraise performance. We're seeing how well or badly the company has done, maybe how well or badly the manager has done within the company. Therefore, it will directly re uh, relate to reward. Um, if we were looking at investment appraisal, well, we've already said we're looking at decision making. So to a certain extent, they are fundamentally different. Yes, both will have some profit measure on top. Some, both will have some form of capital employed on the bottom. But they are wholly different. Please remember that. And the final observation is simply this. The only reason why ROCE for the existing company may be useful, you know, what happened in the past, is that we could use that as the target for investment appraisal. We don't have to. We could use last year's ROCE to appraise future performance. Or we could use some other target instead. Well, okay. If that's the case, let's consider how we calculate ARR. I say ARR, I use these terms interchangeably. I said that we need some sort of measure of profit. So we start with an estimated average annual profit. We divide through by our average, well, I could say capital employed, but what we're really focusing on is investment. We express it as a percentage, simple as that. Well, okay, given that this is what we're trying to calculate, how do we go about it? Well, it's not a problem. Let's go back to the original question. If we look at the original question, we're going to use this information for our ARR. There's only one thing that concerns me slightly. We're given cash flows. And remember, ARR is based on profit. So what do we have to do? Well, exactly right. What we have to do here is to convert cash flow into profit, and we do that by taking away the depreciation. Let's go ahead and see what happens. So, if we were looking at the estimated average profit, should I say average annual profit, our starting point would be to get the total cash flows. Looking back at the project, the total cash flows should be very straightforward. 50,000, 40,000, 30, 25, 20. Add them all together. So, we total all these. We get our total cash flows of 165,000 over the life of the project. 
Remember, to get to profit, we deduct depreciation. Note here, we are looking at depreciation over the whole life of the project. To do that, couldn't we simply say that we know at the beginning it was worth 100? And at the end, I don't know if you remember, the residual value was 5? So over the five-year life, we have depreciation of 95,000. Therefore, we get our total profit. Our total profit of 70,000. Right. Given that we have our total profit, please note, before we go any further, the key working is to take away that depreciation. I don't think it's difficult at all. But normally, we do an ARR calculation after we've done something relating to cash flow. If we remember to deduct depreciation, we are sorted. If we have our total profit, we can easily calculate our average profit. How many years were there? Exactly right. We had five years. So if we divide by five years, hey presto, abracadabra, we get an average profit of 14. Well, okay, given that we have our average profit, now what we want to do is to establish our average investment. Now, I do not want you to let me down at this stage. So let's just walk away and think about how this average investment thing works. If I were just to sketch up the investment over time. The life of the project starts at year zero. Yes, this point in time, we're standing at the end of year zero and continues until year five. What is the value of the investment in year zero now? Well, the value is going to be 100. Simple as that. And what's the value in year five? Well, we know already the value is five. Now, what we assume here is that the value of the investment falls at a constant rate. Therefore, what's the average investment? Well, presumably, it's the halfway point between the two. And how do we get that halfway point? Well, all we have to do is to take the simple average of the start and the end point. At the start, it is worth 100. At the end, it is worth 5. The simple average of the two, we divide by 2, and hey presto, abracadabra, we get our average investment. It really is that simple. Well, okay. Given that we have that value, our average investment, let's just slot it in here. The value at the beginning, 100, plus the value at the end, 5, divided by 2, hey presto, 52.5. Well, okay, we've got our average profit, we've got our average investment, we're able to calculate ROCE. ROCE will be 14 divided by 52.5. 26.6 or something thereabouts. Question for you, is that good or is it bad? Ah, once bitten, twice shy. Yes, you're right. We cannot say that it's good or bad. Having said that, because it's positive, it suggests that some measure of return has occurred. But again, just like payback, we have to compare this value against some sort of target. So, calculating ARR. The key, of course, is that you have to learn this particular formula. Not difficult, but it ain't given to you. So I would simply say, learn this. 
If you know that, and you remember to offset depreciation, you should be able to pick up the marks. Well, okay, we've calculated our ARR. What does it show us? Well, the only thing I can tell you is this. It shows us the impact of the investment on accounting profit. Yes, it is a measure of return. It is a measure of accounting return. Let's just briefly discuss a couple of advantages and disadvantages. The first advantage, I'm not quite sure if that's an advantage, widely used. I suppose it reflects the fact that when companies do investment appraisal, they almost invariably calculate ROCE. Remember, the reason why they do this is because, at least in the short term, they want to know how their financial performance will be affected. If you're a manager and you are rewarded by a bonus based on profit, that will be of great importance to you. Secondly, it's relatively simple. I hope so. Thirdly, it can be calculated from available accounting data. Well, notice the question mark there. Available accounting data? It relates to the future. What I'm trying to emphasize is that even a financial accountant could do this because they know what a profit measure is. The only real advantage that I get excited about is that it is a measure of return. Something that payback does not give us. If we were to look at disadvantages, well, yes, we look at the time value issue, something that we must talk about in a moment. Secondly, it's based upon subjective accounting profit. What do I mean by subjective accounting profit? Well, what I'm trying to get at is this. Accounting profit can be manipulated. To give you an idea, many years ago when I had a proper job, one of my roles was to work as the financial controller. And working for the, as the financial controller for a subsidiary of a large company, near the end of the year, the boss man used to come down and speak to me. He used to say, Rob, what accounting profit have we made this year? And what would I say back to him? Well, why was he asking me what accounting profit there was? Well, the issue was he earned his bonus based on the profit. So, given that he tells me the level of accounting profit that he wants, what can I do? Well, to some degree, I can manipulate the profit. In the business that I operated in, we had 14 million pounds worth of inventory. So, a small view on the inventory, either writing off inventory that was a bit old, or writing up inventory that maybe had been written off in the past, I could manipulate profit in this year. We had lots of different assets. So, in simple terms, what I could do is maybe consider whether or not those assets really should be on the fixed asset register. So even in my lowly position, I could to some degree, at all times of course, being wholly ethical, manipulate the profit. You see, profit is subjective because it is dependent on the accounting policies that you adopt. So, the reason why we don't like ARR is that it is potentially subjective. Difficult to compare one ARR to another because it depends very much on what individual companies use as their accounting policies. And that conflicts with what we said with payback. Remember payback? That's the reason why we like cash flows, because cash flows are not subjective, or at least they shouldn't be. Cash flows are what we expect to incur, what we expect to receive, nothing more nothing less. Thirdly, it's not an absolute measure of return, it's a percentage. 
Now, this has its good and bad points. Percentages are easier for managers to interpret. But they are relative measures and, as such, need to be compared against something. If it was an absolute measure, we would get our answer in pounds and pennies, or sorry, in your exam, dollars and cents. And as such, maybe they are more useful to consider the overall impact on profit. Now let's look at an exam standard question. I have the requirement in front of us. Part A, the bit that we are really interested in just now. Determine whether the proposed capital investment is attractive to Armcliffe using the average rate of return on capital method defined as average profit to average capital employed. Fine, that's what you and I already know. B. Suggest three problems which arise with the use of the average return method. Well, we've looked at the disadvantages and we could use those maybe as the problems. Two, in view of the problems associated with the ARR method, why do we continue to use the project appraisal? Well, it's a measure of return, it's easily interpreted by uh, managers, and it's important to understand the impact on profit. Um, what about part C? Again, something relating to working capital, not part of this particular part of the course. Classic issue here, 13 marks to do with ARR and seven marks to do with something completely different. Now, I think we could answer part C without really knowing that much. But don't worry, it's covered later on in the course. Briefly discuss the dangers of offering more generous credit and suggest ways of assessing customers' credit worthiness. Well, I think you know what I'm going to say here. The key word is and. Here, there are two wholly separate questions. On the one hand, dangers of offering credit. On the other hand, how do we assess credit worthiness? That means that we don't have a seven marker. Instead, we have a three and a four marker, or if you wish, a four and a three marker. Please, try and break down the questions as best you can. Well, okay, let's look at the information in the question. Armcliffe is a division of Sharon, which requires each of its divisions to achieve a rate of return on capital employed of at least 10% per annum. Bang! We have our target. So once we've calculated something, we are going to compare and contrast to this target. Great. For this purpose, capital employed is defined as fixed capital and investment in stocks. Ah, so we're told specifically what the investment relates to. Remember, the clue is in the question. This rate of return is also applied as a hurdle rate for new investment projects. Great. Divisions have limited borrowing powers and all capital projects are centrally funded. Fine. We could make a big thing of that. I don't wish to. Below, what we have are bits and pieces to do with a profit and loss account, statement of comprehensive income, I think, nowadays, and to do with our balance sheet, or should I say statements of financial position. My question to you is this. Should we be including this information in our analysis? I'm thinking most of you are thinking yes. And the answer is no way. Remember, this information relates to the past. Therefore, it cannot be to do with any investment appraisal. We are looking at the future. So, this information may be useful elsewhere, but it is not useful when it comes to looking at this particular question. Reading on. 
Armcliffe's production engineers wish to invest in a new computer-controlled press. The equipment cost is 14 million. Bang, we have the capital expenditure. The residual value is expected to be 2 million after four years of operation. Great, another critical piece of information. What other information are we given? Ah, well here we see the exciting stuff. The new machine is capable of improving the quality of the existing product and also of producing a higher volume. The firm's marketing team is confident of selling the increased volume by extending the credit period. And the expected additional sales are as follows. Now, this is something we talk about later, but it's worth bringing up now. Have you noticed each year that they change? Now, this is not a big thing. But as we'll find in a moment, it means that we will have to analyse the question a bit more than maybe we wanted to. Reading on. Sales volume is expected to fall over time because of emerging competitive pressures. Competition will also necessitate a reduction in price by 50 pence each year from the £5 per unit proposed in the first year. Ah. We've got two things going on. The volume changes each year, and the price drops each year. Because of that, we can't bring it all together. We're going to have to do a separate analysis for year one, two, three, and four to get the appropriate numbers out. Again, we have to talk about that later. Operating costs are expected to be steady at one pound per unit. Fine. And Allocation of overheads, none of which are affected by the new project. Should we be interested in this number? It's an allocation, which means it's probably arbitrary in the way that the overheads have been spread. And it's not affected by the investment. Should we be including this figure? Well, if you remember your decision-making, I think you would say no, no, and no again. You would say it's not a relevant cost. And this is a slight problem with the ARR. You see, the ARR is looking at calculating a profit measure. And when we calculate a profit measure, we will include costs that are not relevant, which does question whether it is a sensible appraisal method. And we're told that they're 75 pence. Higher production levels will require additional investments in stock, which would be held at this level until the final stages of the project. So, I think we're saying that the stock is half a million at all times until the very end of year four. Again, something to talk about in a moment. Well, okay, given that we have this information, let's give it a go. Let's see if we can get some sort of information out. First of all, we want our average profit. So we put our years across the top. One, two, three, and four. And at some stage, we'll get some sort of total. Now, please note, there are lots of ways of doing this. If you find a way that's slightly quicker than mine, well done you. What we have is we have our sales. Sales in thousands. And if we note back through the question, we were given 2 million, 1.8 million, 1.6, 1.6. Okay? So, let's just slot them in. In some examples, it may be sensible to establish the total sales, but I don't think it really helps us here, at least not the way I intend to do this question. 
then we had our selling price. Now, if we looked at the selling price, we said that it was five pounds per unit. But hold on a moment. It falls by 50 pence per unit each year. 450, four pounds, 350. What we want to do is to offset our costs. And if you remember, we had some operating costs, one pound per unit. And we also had that nasty bit that we really don't want to include, but of course we must do if we wish to calculate the profit, 75 pence. Selling price less costs? Well, given the nature of the costs, we don't really know what we're calculating here. But I'm reckoning that we're calculating some sort of margin thing. Not quite sure. Something like, what have we got here? 3.25, 2.75, 2.25, and 1.75. I will reiterate. When we're looking at this question, there are lots of different ways of analysing the numbers. Well, OK. So we've got our margin. Multiplied by the sales, we can get our, well, for want of a better term, our total margin. As I say, it's not a profit, it's not a contribution. I don't really know what to quite call it. So if we multiply our sales by the total margin, we can get everything in thousands of pounds. 2 million multiplied by 3.25 comes to 6.5. 1.8 multiplied by 2.75. I'm guessing that comes to something like 4.950. 2.25 multiplied by 1.6. 3.6. And 1.75 multiplied by 1.6. Two, eight. I think now we're able to work across and establish what the total margin is for the four years. Everything else we can do in total terms. If that's the case, what do we have here? We have something like 17, 17.850, something like that. Well, okay. So we've got our total margin of 17,850. What was it that we were trying to calculate? Well, yes, we're trying to calculate here the profit figure. And at the moment, we've got some sort of cash flow type thing. So what do we have to offset from this figure to get profit? Well, exactly right. What we want to offset is depreciation, remember? That is the fun bit in these questions. Depreciation. Well, if you remember back, the asset was purchased for 14 million. And the residual value was 2 million. Therefore, the depreciation was 12 million. Offset depreciation and we get total profit. Total profit, therefore, 5850. And once we've got total profit, what do we then do? Well, we want the average profit per year. Therefore, to get the average profit, all we do is divide through by four years. Nothing could be simpler. 1462.5, something like that. Step by step by methodical step. Notice this question's got quite a few numbers here but we're doing exactly what we did before. Um, remember, that's the trick to remember in the exam. I don't think you will get a question quite this complicated in the exam. You probably already have your cash flows from some other computation.
just bring them in here and offset depreciation. We're not out of the woods just yet, though. We have a little bit more to do. Of course, what we need is our average investment. Now, if we look at the average investment, we have the capital expenditure. How do we deal with that? Well, most definitely, when we look at the average investment, we take the simple average of the start and the end point. It was worth 14 million at the beginning of the project. It was worth 2 million at the end. Add them together and divide by 2, 8,000. Given that we have our capital expenditure, what else do we need? Well, I don't know if you remember, all the way back to the top of the question, we were told that capital employed is defined as fixed capital and investment in stocks. So we have to add them in. If you remember, right at the bottom of the question, investment in stocks were half a million. Well, hold on a moment. Do we take the average of the start and end point? Do we depreciate stock or inventory? I'm hoping your answer is no. It is a current asset. And what we're told is that the stock remains constant for the whole four years of the project. If that's the case, we don't want any, any form of simple average. All we want to do is to add the stock, or should I say inventory, just to make you happy, of 500,000. We've got our average investment, 8.5 million. Job done. Simple as that. Therefore, we calculate our ROCE or ARR. Notice I use the terms interchangeably again and again. And what do we have? 1462.5 divided through by 8,500 multiplied by 100. And it comes to something like 17.2%. Now, given that it comes to 17.2%, can we make a decision? Do you remember that first piece of information given in the question? We were told that the target was 10%. Here we see that the return that we've calculated is 17%. Decision. Accept the project. The ROCE is greater than the hurdle rate. That just means the target. The hurdle rate of 10%. Whenever you're looking at investment appraisal, if you can, make a decision. Remember, we're looking at decision making. Therefore, it is normally worth a mark. So what we've managed to deal with here is the second methodology. This has been very popular with your examiner. Very popular. In fact, it came up in the pilot paper. And you could normally argue that anything in the pilot paper is a key area of the syllabus from the perspective of the examiner. So, it will come up on occasion. And if it does come up, you must get it right. Know your formula, and you've sorted ARR. Job done.